Um, in August of 1991, I packed my woolies and my parka, and I boarded an airplane in Montreal to fly to the north. And I arrived at my destination 56 hours later, in August. It was fog, not snow, that had caused the delays, but that's just one of the ways that the Arctic can challenge and surprise you. So one of the other things that surprised me during my first few days there were these flowers, fireweed, I believe. And they would grow on the tundra, seeming to grow right out of the rock or just a few millimeters of soil. And for all that we might associate with the tundra, the fact that these flowers would bloom for a few weeks in summer to add their blast of magenta to the grays and browns of the granite and then disappear under a blanket of snow for nine or ten months with the hopes of blooming again the next year gave me the feeling that the Arctic was a place of durability, resilience, and beauty rather than the barrenness and cold that we might think of. I was in the Arctic to teach my first job. I was going to be teaching junior high school to a group of eight kids aged 10 to 19, seven girls and one boy in a village of just over 200 people. On my first day, I went into the classroom to kind of gather my thoughts for the day and the year ahead, and I paced around my room trying to find some way to calibrate my voice to the right mix or intonation that would communicate the compassion, the friendliness, and the sense of purpose that I needed to have to get through the year ahead. And as I was lost in that meditation, the school principal scurried into the classroom, the embodiment of panic. And he started looking around from desk to desk, inspecting what was inside each. And I realized that the students left their materials, their belongings, in the desk from one year to the next. Something that told me that, in many ways, the room was more theirs than mine. And also made me wonder if what happened in the room had any connection with what happened in the village. So after a few moments, I asked him if there was any way that I could help. And he explained to me that he was looking for the desk of a 15-year-old boy who committed suicide that summer. And in that news, he immediately expanded what I was anticipating to do that year. And before I could fully absorb that, he added that I would have his girlfriend and his little sister. And he emptied the boy's desk and he left. Five minutes before my teaching career is about to begin, I realize that I'm going to have to take on the role of grief counselor or social worker in a community where one is not likely to get parachuted in. And then I would do it in the shadow of a boy that I'll never meet. So I head down to the gym for the opening ceremonies for the school year and I'm introduced to my students and we head back to the classroom very tentative and very cautious about what to do and what's ahead. So with all of these things in mind I do my best to introduce myself and give the kids something to kind of grab onto and take an interest in and communicate back with me about. Silence. They didn't even correct me if I mispronounced their names. So the silence built and built, and I just caved. I gave in and I resorted to plan A, which would be this supposedly fun handout where I would ask the kids to answer some questions about themselves, to give me some information that might inform what I do throughout the rest of the year. So I handed them the sheet, the silence remained, and I paced around from desk to desk. There aren't really rows when you have eight, eight kids in the class. So the youngest in the class, the 10-year-old boy, was fine. Every answer was about hockey in any way possible. And then I stopped and I looked over the shoulder of the girlfriend, the 19-year-old girl, and in a ragged, almost violent uppercase, she answered one question about her future. And she said, I want to dead myself. And I froze. The fact is, everybody froze. 
the kids froze, the parents froze, the principal knew that it was risky to tell me what had happened in the village five days earlier when I arrived or three months earlier when I first accepted the job. There was every risk that if he told a new teacher that he had not met face to face and looked in the eye, that that teacher would just say, um, sorry, I can't make it. I found a job elsewhere and I won't be coming. It was very difficult for him to even talk about the social problems that were existing in his village. About four or five weeks after the start of the year, I was walking out of the school on a Friday afternoon and I found the principal sitting in a stairwell by himself in a daze and he told me that there was another teenage suicide in a nearby village and it was impacting him. I knew it was still not time for me to ask him about that suicide or the one in our village, um, but somehow we found a way to talk about simpler times. When he was younger, he had gone out on the tundra to go hunting in late spring. And while he was out there, he got caught in a storm. He could see the signs that it was coming, and he knew that he would not get back to the village in time. So he did what he could to make do where he was. He tried to build an igloo, but due to the moisture or other conditions, one just wouldn't hold together. It kept falling in on him. So as a last resort, he just buried himself in the snow and cocooned himself there and lay there until the storm passed and it was safe enough for him to dig himself out and go home. In the face of the social problems that his community was facing, he did not have the ability to see the warning signs that this young man was going to take his life. He did not know when the storm or the repercussions of the suicide were going to ease away from his community. And least of all, he did not have the skills or the experience or the knowledge to identify the context that contributed to that suicide or the repercussions that came from it. He had a hard time just even talking about social problems. When he talked about social problems, in particular with the 19-year-old girlfriend, he had this odd intonation to social problem that seemed to suggest that a social problem was just a personal problem that got out of hand. He had no idea or no grasp of the impact that social problems are having on his entire community and what the consequences are. And the reality was that in the space of two or three generations, so much of their lifestyle and their culture and their heritage had changed due to technological and social changes that had come from the, the, the South. In the space of those two or three generations, his community was introduced to metal pots guns, money and credit, a character system to read and write their language in, a numbering system to replace their family names, television, frozen pizza, Nintendo, and the internet. And in the face of all of those changes that were taking place, it was very difficult for people to know where they were going next and what was the ideal path for them. The mother of the boy who committed suicide had put it best when she said that she, as a mother, did not know whether it was best for her to encourage her children to go back out on the tundra and throw it all away and risk taking their survival in their own hands in the, that environment or just to go the other direction and completely buy into what was coming from the South. In the face of those problems, we in the classroom had to move away from the, the typical curriculum and move away from algebra, long division, Judy Bloom novels, and mastery of the past perfect to look at some of the more deep things that the children were struggling with. We had to move on to talk about ways to deal with the suicide and their feelings about it, but also deal with teenage pregnancy, solvent abuse, drug use, and violence at home. And throughout that time, the kids continued to ask the same question. Why are we here? On a weekly, if not a daily basis, they kept coming back to that question. Sometimes it meant, why are we in school? 
Other times they were wondering why they were in the settlement rather than out on the tundra. They wondered why they were in the north at all rather than relocated entirely to a community further south where it was warmer and more comfortable and they were surrounded by more amenities. They realized that they were living in a time and place where their separation from the landscape that was their backyard or their soul or their home was wreaking havoc on their community. Their grandparents and their great-grandparents were able to live in a situation where their confidence and determination allowed them to survive and thrive. Under the environment where I was teaching them, doubt and apathy and despair seemed to be the things that took hold of their life and never let go. So in the face of all that, those questions and the kids' quest for their own purpose and perhaps even the question of what my purpose was there in their community and in their school, they wanted to know something. And I felt as their teacher that it was my task or my responsibility to come up with the answer or the proposal that would make all of their questions go away and bring some ni nicely wrapped contentment and realization about their lives and their futures. And try as I might every day to answer their question and refused to settle for a cheap answer like, you are in school to help you get a job, I couldn't come up with an answer that would satisfy me or them. For all of the time that I spent with them, preparing them for high school, if that was what they wanted to do, helping them heal from the suicide, to deal with the social problems that emerged from one day to the next, to help them deal with their dental hygiene on a daily basis, and to make sure they impressed their parents in the Christmas concert, there was still this anxiety that ultimately all I was doing was reinforcing the despair and the apathy that came with that school I was a part of. So, in the March of my second year, nearly burning out and realizing that I would not be coming back for a third year, the question came to me. It was almost desperate. A few minutes before lunch, on a a quiet morning, I stopped and I asked the kids, what do you want me to teach you? And they said they wanted me to teach them to live off the land. They wanted me to teach them how to cook. They wanted me to teach them how to build igloos. We ran on into the lunch break talking about all of the things that they wanted me to teach. And when it came to the topic of igloos, I asked them, why can't your parents teach you that? And they said, because you're the teacher. And that was the extent of the disconnect between the kids and their parents and their culture after 25 or 30 years of teachers like me coming to that school and insisting that their kids be in that classroom within those four walls for 10 months of the year. So two days later, after talking to the principal, the school closed down for an afternoon and the kids went out and built igloos with their parents. And in the days that followed, the kids continued to build the igloos independently. And at night, I could look out my kitchen window and I could see the blue and yellow glow of the light within them as they slept in the igloos overnight. And I realized that in all of that dialogue that we built up to until we came to that igloo lesson was that the kids had an appetite for a struggle to survive. And they knew that they needed a struggle in order to survive. And that for all of the amenities and comfort and wooden houses and running water that we exported to them, we did not export to them a struggle or a purpose to define their lives. When we here today think about the struggle to survive, we do not have to worry about getting involved in farming or fishing or hunting or gathering to get the food or the energy that we need to get us through a winter. Often when we talk about a struggle to survive, we talk about not having Wi-Fi or having our flight delayed or having scheduled car maintenance take a little longer than we had hoped. But the reality is that we 
despite everything that is technological and bringing us comfort and convenience, we still need a struggle in order to survive. If we have that struggle to challenge us, to work toward, to identify what we are capable of, and at times to unite us, we will start to realize our own individual or collective potential. If we look beyond the new and the next and the shiny technological veneers that we surround ourselves with and instead look at more lasting things and invest ourselves in the environment that we are surrounded by or in the unconditional love that we give and receive, we will find our struggle to survive. If we put ourselves into those relationships that are most important to us, instead of taking it for granted that tomorrow or later or next time will give us the chance to get it right, we will find what we are seeking. And once again, we will be able to pass lessons on from generation to generation. Thank you.